The first speaker is Mark Booth, who was senior archivist in the Warwickshire County Record Office, now retired and still keeping his hand in with part-time work, and he is a volunteer in the County Record Office. And he is going to speak today about something that has come to life, I'm tempted to say, in the last um, 10, 15 years through computerization, the, what used to be sort of boxes of slips um, kept in quality court, you may remember, the Manorial Documents Register, and he is talking on the Manorial Documents Register and the Historic Towns Project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, uh, both of these projects uh, have been supported by the County Record Office. They're not actually initiated by the County Record Office, but supported by the, the, the Office. And I have been involved in both of them, either uh, in a paid capacity, which of course is much preferable, or a volunteer capacity. The first thing I'm going to speak about is the Historic Towns Project, uh, which is part of a county-wide or country-wide program initiated by English Heritage. It has the aim of compiling surveys of information about historic towns, so that's archaeology, topography, historic buildings of the towns, primarily in order to, in order to enable planning authorities to protect the character of these towns. The work is financed by English Heritage, uh, but they have received contributions from county and unitary authorities. It's being done county by county. So far, about half the country has been completed, and the Warwickshire uh, project is now in progress. This uh, shows the coverage of England so far. The red areas have already been completed, and the green areas are underway. Uh, that should include Warwickshire, which is not yet colored green on that map. So you can see about uh, over half the country has already been done. The project involves three stages of work, uh, a database stage, gathering information from a variety of sources and adding it to the database. Uh, the sources would include archaeological excavations and other discoveries, information about historic buildings, historic maps and historic documents, and published literature. And it's the last three things that I have been involved in, these historic maps, documents, and published literature. The assessment stage, which follows on, involves writing a summary report on the history and archaeology and historic top top topography of each town, which would be illustrated with maps and would contain details of the sources on which the report is based. And finally, there's a strategy stage, which involves developing local authority policies, protecting and managing the archaeological and historical interests uh, of each town. And following con consultation, this is an important thing, publishing these reports. So these reports will end up in the public domain one way or another. And in fact, the record office itself will probably make, be making use of the information that we've uh, gathered in, in various ways. Right, so in Warwickshire, 20 towns have been identified um, as being of historic interest. Some of these uh, probably strike you as being not very town-like, but in every case, there is uh, some form of evidence that they were either a town or um, people were planning to make it into a town. Uh, uh, the definition being that it would have functioned as a centre for the surrounding villages in some way, an economic centre. Right, now the record office has been commissioned by the uh, County Museum's historic environment record, who are actually producing the final report, to gather the documentary evidence uh, on each town, both within the record office itself and from other record offices or other sites as part of the first stage. Uh, I'm responsible for producing the final text of these reports, uh, but most of the work has been carried out by volunteers um, that we've gathered from the, uh, from the friends of the record office or from people who are doing work at the record office. Now, we are now about halfway through. Yes, that shows you the towns. Um, you can see the completed list is about halfway through, so it's all well on track. Um, what we've done, or what I did in fact initially, was to devise a structure. Um, sorry. Which is this document here. 
um, which was a guidance sheet for the volunteers. So there's an introduction which tells them which uh, places to look at are indexes on the internet, etc., for various types of record. And then underneath that, uh, there's a grid which they complete for various types of records, antiquarians, papers, building plans, it goes on and on and on. Uh, we'll see that in more detail later on. That's what they use in order to complete this information. Um, as regards the printed material, uh, in fact, a lot of that I did for the very first town that I did. I compiled a list of the standard printed literature, the, the county directories, uh, the ordnance survey maps, um, uh, the newspapers, etc., that cover the whole county. So that's already in there. They only have to look at things that relate particularly to that town. So that's the structure of the report. And then a completed report. I've got an example here just to give you a, a feel for the sort of information and how useful it might be for you. It starts off with an introduction in which I would go through um, the historical background to the town, its administrative history, picking out any themes of particular interest, uh, whether there are particularly important industries in the town, its manorial history, all that sort of thing, um, which just gives you a general overview, and then going down to complete um, all the primary sources, so whether there are antiquarians' papers, this is Nuneaton, as you will see, um, there's quite a number of people who have uh, written about the history of uh, Nuneaton and then deposited their papers in the record office, um, business records, um, what else, census returns, so easy enough to pick up, uh, turnpikes, communications, roads, canals, turnpikes, railways, anything we can find out about that, um, the diocesan records, court records, court of sessions, magistrates court records, all with their references down in the column on the left hand side where they're to be found, um, deeds, Huge problem with deeds, of course, in a big town you get masses and masses. So in Nuneaton we've divided up by street so as to be as helpful as possible. Um, and so on and so forth. Industries, um, lots of coal and industry, uh, brick making, etc. etc. Um, landed estates, any landed estates that had a major impact upon the town. They're covered. County council records, manorial records, and so on and so forth. So it's all there um, in the form of this written report. I say these reports will then become publicly available. So it will give a snapshot of what is available for all of these places, which I hope will be very useful to local historians. Right. Um, it was also useful, actually, this information, or fed into the manorial documents register because. Um, some of the towns we did before the memorial uh, document project started. I will just try and get that up now. Uh, okay, the memorial documents project, this is something initiated by the National Archives, and it had its origins, of course, in the old Historical Manuscripts uh, Commission project to list memorial records on cards that uh, were held in their headquarters at Quality Court. And the TNA has decided to uh, computerize this, turn it into an act, uh, a database and make it publicly available. And they're planning to extend this to the whole of England and Wales. In England they're doing it county by county. Uh, I think about 16 counties have already been done. Um, there has been a partnership element within this. Um, the county record has provided accommodation for the project officer, who was Neil Betridge in the case of, um, our, in our case, um, and he has worked in the record office for about a year, uh, but not just in, in, in Warwickshire, he's also gone out to other record offices to uh, see what holdings they've got. And there was also a volunteer element to this. In fact, um, Dr. Nat Olcock, who was originally at uh, Warwick University, was heavily involved in pushing for Warwickshire to get involved in this process and has been a volunteer helping with the production of this. The project is now completed and will be launched online on the 17th of September. Now you can see what it's like, or what it will be like when it appears online on the National Archives website. Um, 
This will be the home page you get into, the manorial documents register. And then you get down to a search page here, which you can search in various ways. You can select a county, you can select a manorial name, a parish, etc., etc. And I've got an example of a search up, um, and I chose uh, Clifford's Chamber, Cl uh, Clifford Chamber, which is uh, in Warwickshire now, but until the 1930s was historically part of Gloucestershire, and the project has dealt with the historic counties, not the modern counties, so Gloucestershire did um, Clifford Chambers. But when you get a, a search up, you get a, a list like this showing what <coughs> memorial documents exist for this particular parish uh, or manor. Um, with their location and their call numbers and whether they're court rolls, surveys, uh, ministers' accounts, etc., etc., etc. So that is what the, the final result will look like. Um, now, as part of Neil's work, he did in fact produce a PowerPoint presentation, so I've still on that. So this is Neil Betridge's presentation uh, explaining what sort of uh, what manners are, what sort of materials <coughs> you can expect, and what sort of Warwickshire material there is. Uh, right, okay, back. Got to be very careful pressing these. Come on, <coughs> that's it. What is a manor? A mansion or country residence, an estate or landed possession, a lordship with a lord and manorial courts with jurisdiction over tenants. A manor can be all of these things at different times, depending on the circumstances. So it just explains what a manor is. Oh, keep doing that. Um, sorry. Previous slide. My own laptop must be less heavy-handed. Yeah, this morning. Manor courts, what they do, their origins in the 12th century, jurisdiction, they have jurisdiction over free tenants, they enforce the laws, right. So I'm, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is Neil's presentation, just laying out what manors do. Um, the types of court that you'll find within a manor, because the court is the main um, instrument of power within the manor, and there are two types of court, court baron, which deals with the lord side, the administration of his estate, etc., which meets very frequently, um, and then the court leet, which is the judicial side of the court, and has powers devolved down from the crown to deal with civil and criminal matters, uh, held usually held twice a year. So. The manor, the manor uh, court is in fact an extremely powerful instrument within the, the, the community, dealing with all sorts of um, civil and uh, legal affairs that you are now dealt with by public authorities. And then he has a couple of slides that detail the sort of business you find on court rolls. So the people, assoyans, the people who are excusing themselves from presence, the jury or homage who are named there, presentments to the court um, by individuals or the jury or, or whatever that uh, need to, uh, cases that need deciding, inquisitions, um, passing of bylaws, uh, the fining of people for transgressing the bylaws, records of land transactions because a lot of people would have held land of the manor by copy of the manor roll, as it is said. Uh, so in fact. Uh, where this continues, you will get a complete record of land um, ownership and the passage of land, elections of officers, the inferior's adjustments on, of fines. So all these things may turn up in manorial court rolls. Um, I've already mentioned that uh, a lot of land work in a manor is held by copy of the court roll, um, that in return for rents and labour services, uh, some would be held on a free tenure um, usually they'd just be paying a, bit, a small rent. Others, unfree ten uh, tenure, where they would often be paying in services as well, which evolves into the copy hole that survives until 1922, where a manorial court continued to exist. <coughs> and finally, custom of the manor, because each uh, manor built up its own set of customs, its own framework of regulations that is often written down, uh, and gives a great insight into what the manor does. And then there's a series of uh, individual 
um, documents. So we start off with court rules. Um, the earliest court rule surviving for a Warwickshire manor in the county record of it is this one for Wolvey up in the north of the county from 1315. Um, but uh, the very earliest surviving anywhere is one for the manor of Atherston, which was held um, by the Abbey of Beck in Normandy, uh, which dates from 1247 to 1248. And then early, early series of court rolls. Um, Atherston dates back to 1334. And this is a nice example of um, the admission of people, uh, surrender and admission of land, dealing with copyhold land. This is um, John the Miller and his wife Elizabeth in 1334 obviously decided to settle their lands upon their children. And there are four entries up here for John the Miller and his wife settling land on their children, individual children. So a great wealth of information about land holding. Um, this is um, an Ulster court row, another really good series of court rows that begins in the early 15th century. This court row of 1424 is dealing with the uh, tasters of bread and ale under the assizes of that act. It's really uh, quality control. It's mm -hmm. the, um, making sure that people are providing ale and bread that is up to standard of the right weight, etc., etc., etc. And the tasters here, the people, the officers responsible for that, are reporting at the head on people who have transgressed the side. I see we're getting a bit... It's sort of five-minute warning. Five-minute, right, okay. We'll zoom through. Um, I'll, I'll pick up just on this court roll, because this is really nice. Um, two entries here which reflect uh, the the legal administration of the manor, uh, both in um, transgression and making, uh, making laws. The first entry up here is for two servants, one Margaret the servant of Thomas Stretton of Atherston, and the other is Elmer, uh, servant of the schoolmaster of Atherston, who are held up for stealing from Thomas de Stretton um, various clothes, a, toga, a gown worth um, 20 shillings, very expensive, three bed covers worth 13 and fourpence, seven linen sheets worth seven shillings, so they obviously stripped his bedroom. And underneath that is a bylaw down here for prohibiting the playing of tennis in the streets of Atherston with a fine of, I forget what it is, 40 pence, quite substantial fine if you're caught playing tennis in Atherston in 1420. Um, We'll skip on a bit because there are various other court rules and we won't worry about that. Um, this, I was just going to make the point uh, that in a small number of cases, these manorial courts continue as very active institutions right up, as in some cases, to the 20th century. And by the 18th century, the record is often not in roll form, but a, a big volume. Um, so a volume by name and voluminous in nature, like containing a lot of information. Atherston, for instance, a series of court rolls that starts in 1743 and goes on up to um, 1871, I think. And there are various other, about six or seven courts in the county that continue into the 20th century. And these are just examples of pains and orders made by the Atherton um, uh, Manor Court very late indeed, 1859, in printed form, dealing with all the usual things uh, that you would have expected at this time a town council to be dealing with, but no, at Atherston, the, count, the court is continuing and it is doing it. And then copyhold was abolished by the Law of Property Act in 1922, which uh, removed the principal raison d'etre of the remaining manorial court, and um, most of them slid gently into decay. A few of them still continue in a sort of ceremonial manner, but otherwise, for all practical reasons, they've stopped. I think we'd better end at that. I was going to go on and describe all other sorts of memorial records, but we'll call it a day. Um, so that is basically what the Record Office has been helping with these two projects. Thank you very much. <laughs> We have time for two or three minutes of questions. Um, would people <coughs> like to? Yes. Far away. Could, could we go back to the, the Historic Towns project? Yes. Um, I, I 
Is there a website for the project as a whole? Because I can't there find one. There is a website on the Share Adventure. If anyone tells you what the project is doing, it has a, you know, a sheet showing out the map that shows which ones have been completed. But the information is not there. And I don't think they're intending to do it like that. It's really the responsibility of the individual county museums um, to make the information publicly available. Yeah. So there will be some form of written report that's certainly available. How far it's going to be available online depends on the individual authority, I think. It's, it's just I, I could find the various counties, but I couldn't find the overall website. Yeah. But that's because there isn't one. Yes, I think yeah. that's basically right. <laughs> Can you say, how does it relate to the listing of buildings? Is it intended to sort of back up in documentary? Yes, terms? obviously, because the, the prime aim of this is to improve the protection of the, the built environment and the archaeological environment. So it does fit into that very well. And obviously, English Heritage has got an overarching responsibility for both these aspects, the archaeological and the built heritage. So obviously, they're seeing, I don't think it's quite seamless, but yes, they are connected in that sense. And is the aim to sort of move towards identifying particular properties by sort of grid references that could be linked no, up? No, I don't, I don't think so, no. Uh, no, no. I, I expect they'll be using the listed building lists in yes. order to illuminate the town project, yes. but not the other way around yes. at this stage. Yes, yes. Yes. As a parish historians, would you say that the manorial project holds a lot of specific information or would you have to dig through an enormous amount of, of individual court rolls or is there sort of within the manorial survival, is there anything that is directly relevant to the sort of church element of things? No, it would still mean you would be looking, they won't go into that sort of detail. What you'll get is a bare list of, you know, the court, there are court rolls for this oh, period of time, there are surveys, mm -hmm. there are rentals, there are manorial maps, etc., etc., etc. So maps could be used to illustrate obviously oh, yes. land and things yes. like that. Yes. Oh yes, yes, yes. And obviously, in many cases, a manorial um, a surviving manor uh, has got a survey and a, a set of maps uh, that go with it that are extremely illuminating if you're trying to work out the physical shape of the. And the other project you saw, there were obviously lists of church world accounts. Yes, minutes, yeah, yeah. just the main types of records yeah. that were going to be of use. Right. Yes. The so manorial right. accounts would sometimes, if you are very lucky, um, give you in the expenditure paragraphs, they might have expenditure on the church right. if the church and the manor <coughs> were all part of the one estate. Um, I, I, I went looking through some of these for the monastic um, mm -hmm. uh, project purposes, and yeah. um, sometimes, you know, it was lucky, I and mean, um, you could get all sorts of things that were paid locally um, or income that came from local sources mm -hmm. that were part of, if you like, a wider picture mm -hmm. because it just happened that the accountant found it easiest to make payments through a particular place and in the same way you could one, get expenditure. Uh, one point I was going to make, there was one slide which I raced through, which was a, it was a Budbrook a manorial account of the early 15th century. Budbrook was a, uh, a manor of the Earls of Warwick at the time and it includes expenditure on Warwick Castle because at that time presumably the Budbrook accountant had a, a spare pot of money and the Earl's administrative office and said, here, yeah, give us this money to do this work at the castle. So there are accounts mm -hmm. there for building an armourer's house in the, in the mid-15th century. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and what criteria does the town have to meet to be included? Well, it has to be either, either there has to be documentary evidence that sometime, at some stage, it, uh, it actually worked as a town. That is to say, there was a market or there were burgesses. Um, that people were coming there and using it as an economic centre, not just a, an ordinary village, or that there were plans to make it into a town, that somebody went to the king and got a, a licence for a market, even if it never then took off. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.